Hi, this is Scott. I really appreciate our sponsors because they make the show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Developer Express. Become a UI superhero with Dev Express controls and libraries. Deliver elegant.net solutions that address customer needs today by leveraging your existing knowledge. You can build next generation touch enabled solutions for tomorrow. You can download your free 30 day trial at dx.hanselminutes.com. That's dx.hanselminutes.com. From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 520. In this episode, Scott talks with Erin Thompson, formerly of Pixar, about her new startup, Modulo. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. We're here doing March is for Makers. It's all March long. We're doing great hardware and maker stuff. And today we're talking with Aaron Thompson. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on the show, Scott. No, this is exciting. So I uh, was actually doing some Arduino work and I was trying to get a, I hope I get the words right here. It was a, I think it's an accelerometer. I wanted to know about like Uh XYZ. Yep. And I was trying to get it to work with um, uh, a, a, I think it was a particle or a photon. Okay, yeah. And I, I stumbled into some forums, and I saw you having uh, some interactions. Now, we, we pump into forums all the time, and we see people having interactions, except yours included detailed and intense reproductions of the bugs <laughs> that immediately got the attention of the uh, of the moderators, because you had like a... What is it called? Isn't it an oscilloscope of some kind? You were showing the waveforms of what happened at like at the atomic level. Yeah, it was a logic analyzer dump. So it's showing the the logic levels on a couple of the wires over time. So from that, you can see uh, how the two parts on the board are communicating with each other. And there was a problem with how they were communicating. So I was um, including that in order to show the particle folks um, what I thought the bug was so we could figure it out together. And it was such a clear bug with such a clear like uh, explanation of why something was wrong. It seemed like they all kind of like jumped in and into the forum and it became this long, it was rather quite a long uh, post. It went on for months. And yeah, it was pretty long. Yeah, and they acknowledge that this is a problem. So I started uh, digging around and I went to your profile and then found modulo.co, which mm-hmm. is this amazing Kickstarter that you did last year. Well, thank you. It's it's really kind of slick because I've tried Arduinos, I've tried breadboards. A lot of these things are eh, a little intimidating, you know. Like you yeah. you have to learn to you learn to solder, and then you say, "Well, that's that's too hard." Then I'll go down to uh, using breadboards. Uh, what is it about Modulo that makes it even easier to get started? Well, I was always doing projects like that myself. I was a software engineer, and I was doing little hardware projects on the side just for fun, and. Um, like you, I would I would kind of dig in, and then everything was pretty difficult, pretty intimidating, made it hard to kind of get a project going quickly. So I wanted to create something that would solve those problems. Um, so Modulo has these little individual circuit boards, each have a particular component. So, um, you know, there might be one with a joystick on it, one with a little color display, and you can slide these things onto the base. And then as far as the physical construction goes, you're done. You just connect them. Um, So you don't have to worry about logic analyzer diagrams or, Mm. you know, data sheets and all that kind of stuff. You can get right to building your project. Um, So that was kind of my idea. That's, That's where Modulo came from. And that's the problem it tries to solve. So this is a, a higher level of abstraction. How is this different from like an Arduino shield? Well, an Arduino shield is similar in some ways in that you can kind of just you plug it onto the Arduino mm-hmm. and then you can use it more easily than you would if you had to build that whole circuit from scratch. But um, Modulo allows you to connect several different things. So kind of in the size of an Arduino, you can have four different modulos that plug together. And they can be mixed and matched. They can be put in different locations. 
and they all have um, a unique ID that can be used to communicate with them, to identify them. Um, so it's kind of a another step up in terms of being at a higher level and being mm-hmm. a little more modular than what a shield would be. What is the uh, the different communication protocol? Uh, these are these three letter acronyms. As an Arduino mm-hmm. beginner, I'm bumping into. It's like I two C. Yeah, I two C, or people say I squared C. So it's this mm-hmm. old serial protocol. It's been around for for decades, and it's used f- to allow um, multiple components on a board to send data between each other. So it's a relatively simple protocol as protocols go. Um, but it's also really robust. It's supported by a lot of different things. So Modulo makes use of that in order to allow these different modules to communicate with each other. Oh, interesting. Okay. So when I take an Arduino and I, let's say that I took a, uh, an ethernet shield and mm-hmm. I put it on top and it gets bigger and bigger like a sandwich. And then I put a screen on top of that. The Arduino's at the bottom. Yep. Ethernet's in the middle and the screen's on the top. Is the Arduino basically shouting down the line and going, hey, sc- screen, put some stuff there. And the the Ethernet has to pass it all the way up? Um, well, with an Arduino, all of the wires are kind of connected between all of those. Mm. So all the pins are directly connected from the um, Arduino itself through mm-hmm. the shield that's in the middle to the top. So... Um, Particular shields will use particular pins, so there are different oh. pin numbers on each one. Okay. So the display, you know, maybe it uses pins three, four, and five. Mm-hmm. Maybe the the other shield uses the same ones, or maybe it uses different ones. But there's the potential there that that can conflict because they might use the same pins, they might use them in the same way or in different ways. Um, Modulo kind of just uses two pins for everything and oh. there it uses one communication protocol to handle that communication. Um, but you don't ever have to worry about which pins something is using, whether they're already used up by another modulo, you can just kind of connect to whatever you want. So on the, on the website, when you go to modulo.co, you can see like you're plugging in two what look like, like Xbox thumbsticks. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and you move them, you go you know, lower left corner, upper right corner. When you move it, how do you address it? How do you, do you say there's a joystick at this location and does it know about the location or how do you, when you move one from side to side, how do you know to address that? So each modulo has a unique ID burned into it when it's manufactured. Oh. And you can communicate with it using that ID. So it's possible to say, give me all the different joysticks that are connected and it'll return you a list of all those IDs. And then you can talk to a particular one. Or if you just need some joystick, you don't care which one it is. You can just say, use the first one and it'll assume whatever the first one it finds is the joystick you're looking for. Ah, okay. That's really elegant. So it's just like, you know, the difference between an IP address and a MAC address. The MAC address is something that stays with the the Ethernet card or the wireless card. So there's a unique joystick out there and it's it's unique no matter yep. where mm-hmm. it is on the bus. Yep. And there's a process of assigning that address to it and saying, this is the one I'm going to talk to. That's kind of similar to, you know, to use your network analogy, kind of similar to like DHCP where it's assigning an address and now it can talk on the network to everything else. Okay. And then I can enumerate them and say, give me the first one and the last one or the first screen that you find and Mm -hmm. then start start talking to it. That's a really elegant thing. Yeah. I wanted to make it, you know, a lot of times you don't, you're not going to have more than one joystick or more than one display. So I wanted to make it really easy to just do the right thing most of the time, which is to just use the one it finds. Mm -hmm. But then if you do have more, you can very be very specific about which one you're talking to. And that way you can put it in a different place on the board. You can even have multiple boards and daisy chain them together. Um, But wherever you put it, it'll always have that same address and you can always talk to it in the same way. Really? Okay. So then Mm -hmm. if you were referring to a screen by its, uh, you know, it's GUID for lack of a better word. Yep. And you have, it was first in the list. And then later on you had eight of these in a row and you put it at the end. You just keep talking to that screen. That's right. It'll always have the same address and behave the same way, no matter what the physical configuration is. 
that seems like something that should take off. I mean, that seems like such a such a clean and elegant solution. Are there are there similar solutions out there? Um, there are a few. There are some um, temperature sensors that use SMBUS. I don't know if you've heard of that. Mm-mm. It's another one of these protocols. But um, SMBUS is based on I squared C, and it has a similar ability for a one of these temperature sensors to have an ID built into it. Um, and then you can communicate with that particular ID. But I haven't seen other systems that have um, kind of this more general thing where all your different devices speak that. You can use whatever device you want, and they all kind of play by that that same rule. And when we think about people doing um, prototyping and things like Arduino or Raspberry Pis, uh, they, we're always told, well, you're, you're prototyping and then later on you might go to production with that and, mm-hmm. and you know, make it simpler. Would that be something you'd do with modular or would you just leave it as it is and go to production as it is? Well, I kind of wanted to solve more of the hobbyist thing rather than I think that model of prototype it, you know, take it to the next stage. Mm -hmm. design circuit boards that works really well for a product you're creating where you're going to make thousands of these things. But if you're just trying to make one thing, I wanted to make it as easy as possible to just create that thing and have it be Mm -hmm. good enough to actually use for whatever purpose you have in mind. Okay. So for, from a purpose, uh, for, for an example of a purpose, you had a cold last week. So we had to reschedule. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm still getting over bit, it a little yeah, bit. <laughs> I'm hearing a little bit of a tea, uh, in the background there. You made a, uh, a tea maker, a tea pouring robot, didn't you? Yeah, I did. That was one of the example projects we did for the Kickstarter campaign. Uh huh. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, even though we're on a podcast, maybe you could kind of describe, uh, you know, you have a modulo and it has four, quadrants that mm-hmm. one could plug things in. How many did you use and what components would one need to make a tea pouring robot? Um, so we had two two of these bases. These are the things that hold the four modulos. Mm-hmm. Um, one base was on the little robot. And so it would have the controller, which it runs the program to control mm-hmm. the robot. So, so the controller isn't the base. It's one of the modulos is a controller. That's right. Yep. One of the modulos that lets you use different types of controllers if you want to. Hmm. Um, so we had that, and then we had the, um, one of the motor drivers that we have, which can drive two DC motors. Mm -hmm. So we had little DC motors to control the wheels. Um, and then we had a servo motor to control an arm that goes up and down. And at the end of the arm, there was a tea bag. So the tea bag would lower into the cup of tea and raise, and it would do that for a period of time while you're brewing your tea. Um, so that was all on the robot itself. And then we had a cable from the modulo base on the robot to a second base. And that second base had all the controls. So that was kind of like a little game pad almost. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had a joystick on there so you could drive the robot around and drive it up to your, um, cup of tea, uh, a little display that would show you. Whether, you know, if it's currently brewing, it'll say how many seconds are left as it's raising and lowering the tea bag. Um, and then two knobs that would let you either manually um, raise and lower the arm, or mm-hmm. you could change the duration that you want to steep your tea if you turn the other knob. And was this one of the, did you call it a rainbow knob? Is a knob that also has lighting? Yeah. It, um, yeah, it has an RGB LED. Mm-hmm. And it's a push button and it's a rotary encoder. So that lets you do a lot of um, different user interactions, whether it's you just want to push it to switch something on and off, provide some basic feedback, dial a number, you know, change a position. Um, it's a pretty versatile little um, input device. Some of the stuff that you've got here, if you, you know, again, this is at Modulo dot co m o d u l o dot co really blows my mind like you've got an oled display that is like an inch and a half wide that yeah. is its own module i mean that's insane i just <laughs> I can't even get my head around that yeah it's really nice we started out with just a, a black and white display and then when we found we were able to source these um color displays you can just do so much more with them you know if you're drawing a graph or something all of a sudden you can draw several lines on top of each other and make sense of it where you just couldn't do that with a black and white Mm -hmm. screen. So 
there's a lot of really things, that, cool things you did that were very small. Like I'm used to, again, thinking about things in terms of a, an Arduino shield, one shield, one, one use. You've got like a motor driver modulo that can do like two motors or, mm-hmm. or four single ended devices in a, in a tiny little thing the size of an inch. Yeah. Um, you know, some, I think some of these other modular kits that are out there, mm-hmm. they're cool, but they, um, kind of have to use a lot of components in order to build something. Mm-hmm. And I, I knew I could only design and manufacture a fairly small number of boards to start out with. So I wanted to make sure I really made each one as impactful as I could, make, made it useful for a lot of different things. Hey, folks, I wanted to take a moment to tell you about Raygun and their new product called Pulse. Raygun is an error and crash reporting software provider, and their new product, Pulse, it's a real-time user monitoring product. It gives you performance data and user insights. Let's you understand exactly what's happening when users interact with your software, so you're never left guessing. Raygun provides you with the answers to your performance questions, and they've found over 10 billion, that's billion with a B, bugs in customer apps with their crash reporting product, and now Raygun will help you understand application quality like no one else. Over 30,000 developers worldwide can't be wrong. I use Raygun all the time, and I enjoy it very much. You can try it out today with a no-risk 30-day free trial. Start improving your software quality immediately. Try Raygun for free today at Raygun. Dot io. Let me back up a little bit because right now it is 2016 and hardware and IoT is an amazing thing. But as amazing as the stuff that you built is, you didn't start out as a hardware person. No, you I didn't were at all. Software person. Yep. 15 years ago, you were at Pixar mm-hmm. and spent a long time there, didn't you, doing uh, software? Yeah, I spent um, 13, almost 13 years there. Um, and I started out working directly on the films. So I was doing, mm-hmm. um, shading work for Finding Nemo, The Incredibles, Ratatouille. Um, and then after that, I switched over to Pixar's internal software development group. Um, mm-hmm. we at Pixar, we build our own animation software that we animate our films with. And we were doing a large next generation project, um, kind of rewriting all of that software. So I did that for a number of years too, and that was a really amazing project to be part of. Um, but having spent so much time in software, I would feel I, I would feel I'm just kind of feeling myself that it would be very intimidating to like it's still computers, but you're really making a a transition to an entirely different universe here. Where yeah, there's a lot of new stuff, and it's a very different world. Um, for me, that was kind of exciting because I. That's mm-hmm. what I was looking for. I really wanted to do uh, something new, wanted to learn about new things. Um, I'd always kind of played around with electronics, mm-hmm. but I had never, you know, really designed professional quality circuit boards, hadn't done surface mount soldering, hadn't done much firmware development. All of those things were new to me. Um, so, yeah, it was a lot lot to get up to speed on. <laughs> Was that intimidating? I mean, I'm, I'm I'm giving you a compliment, but I'm also a little bit in awe because I could see, like, you know, leaving Pixar and going and making your own, you know, I don't know, 3D shader, mm-hmm. and that would be like a very safe thing to do. It was intimidating, um, but for me at that point, I just I just needed something that felt kind of fresh and new to me, mm-hmm. um, just because I had been working in the same area for a long time, and it's not too bad, you know. Um, the open source hardware community is really incredible right now. There's a lot out there. Mm-hmm. It's so easy to find resources. You can go download the schematics and PCB layouts for, you know, most of your favorite boards. Mm-hmm. And that's a great way to get started. I use that a lot, you know, Adafruit and SparkFun circuit board designs. When I looked at those, looked at how they put them together. Mm-hmm. And that kind of really helped me get going and get to a point where, I could, um, you know, where I could develop my own boards and, and start manufacturing them. Did you have the background in, in the hardware engineering? Because I noticed that we both have similar degrees. You've got a, mm-hmm. a, a degree in computer software engineering, which mm-hmm. is a little bit different, as I recall, from computer science. I did a software engineering degree, which I found to be more um, more hands-on, more practical than a more academic computer science degree? Yeah, I think my my degree was fairly hands-on and practical. 
I didn't mm-hmm. do a lot of hardware in college, but I did do a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd say mostly I taught myself. I just did a lot of projects over the years and learned about it over time. And with a little bit of, of college background I had in it, mm-hmm. um, that was enough to kind of get me through it. I don't, you know, I would not be someone who could go and design a radio frequency f- front end for, a, <laughs> you know, some complicated um, electrical engineering thing, but um, I can get along pretty well with digital circuits <laughs> and basic stuff. And that's kind of all I needed for this project. I think, I think you're selling yourself short g- given that you have a pretty amazing uh, startup here with, uh, with Modulo. Well, thank it's, you. It's- <laughs> Mod- <laughs> modesty indeed but um did you find that you were going back and looking up things like you were in school again like were you looking Absolutely. up like, electrical engineering type basics yep um you know some of it i remembered but um a lot of other stuff either you know i didn't remember the details didn't mm-hmm. know the practical aspects of how to actually do it um mm-hmm. there was a lot of it that's less about um like an electrical engineering theory and more okay. just how you do this stuff. Like how do you actually, you know, use a PCB layout program to lay out a circuit board? How do you actually solder surface mount components for a prototype? That yeah, kind of yeah. stuff is more practical knowledge and a little bit less, um, you know, college book learning kind of stuff. <laughs> right. When you were designing Modulo in, in your mind, did you, how did you validate that it was, you know, correct that it was the way that someone who'd been doing hardware for 20 years would do it? Um, to be honest, I didn't. I mm. kind of just made it work and then, you know, tested it. And if there was a problem, mm. I would dig into that. Um, but I suspect that someone who's a really great hardware engineer would probably find some flaws here and there. <laughs> It sounds like it's working uh, pretty well, though. And the reason that I ask this is that I want to understand, could this have been done 15 years ago, 10 years ago, before open source hardware? Because I think that this is such a wonderful time for people to jump in. Yeah. You had a community to, to kind of help. I think it would have been a lot harder. Um, I think both, you know, finding the information would have been mm-hmm. harder, getting help. Um other companies, you know, like you mentioned, Particle, they've been a really awesome friend and partner mm-hmm. in doing this. Um, and like you said, you know, I just posted on their forum about this problem I was having, and they were able to look into it. They're open source, so I could look at their code and figure out what's going on. They could look at my code. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just the way that you can send out for boards to be made, get them back quickly and cheaply. Mm-hmm. And build them yourself and iterate on that. Um, that was a lot less accessible in the past. And um, that's something people can do now. And it actually makes it possible to start a hardware company without a huge amount of capital. Mm-hmm. So you didn't have to like fly to China and visit warehouses and manufacture plants? I didn't. Plants? Um, I think if I had been at a higher volume, that probably would have made sense. Mm-hmm. But for me, it was a pretty low volume. And so I did it all here. Um, I had a contract manufacturer in Fremont here in the Bay Area that um, did the manufacturing for me. Um, and there was some sourcing in China, but it was all remote. You know, I would email the, the companies there mm-hmm. and get prices on parts, get samples. They would send them over to me. Um, so I was able to do it all just from a home office. When, in a, as a software person, uh, the, I would do everything I can to accelerate what I'm doing. I do continuous integration and mm-hmm. testing and unit tests and integration tests. But can you, if you ship a piece of hardware and it has a bug, what, what kinds of bugs are there? Is it a bug like uh, these two traces are too close to each other or I picked the wrong chip or like, what's a bug in the hardware world and, and how do you deal with it? Yeah, yeah. Um- well, there can be a few different kinds. So some of them are literally, you know, a trace is wrong or, you know, a component is wrong or something. Mm-hmm. And there's not much you can do about that other than, other than, um, hopefully it's not too serious. And if you've tested your stuff, you know, it, it, it functions, then you probably don't have anything too serious. Mm-hmm. Um, but other things can be, you know, more, 
you know, more minor stuff, probably more firmware related. I think mm-hmm. that's a lot more more likely. It's harder to kind of test all the corner cases with your firmware. Mm-hmm. Um, so one thing I did was I actually developed a bootloader that runs on each of these little modules. So mm-hmm. if there is a bug, I'm actually able to create a software fix for that, give someone a program to run that can update the software that's running on their module. Um, so I haven't had to use that yet, but it's give, given me a lot of peace of mind knowing that um, if there's a serious issue, I can actually do that. People don't have to buy new hardware in order to to get the new fix or functionality. Interesting, because that's funny that you, you were, were that thoughtful ahead of time because I'm looking at the display right now. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, what if I wrote some code and crashed the display or I messed up the display or if we found a bug in it? Uh-huh. And you just answered that question that you could give me a program to yep. update the little tiny processor on that little tiny color display. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That is insane. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the other things I thought was cool about it is not just that there's modular um, uh, pieces that are like sensors and buttons and things like that, but is it true that the processor it can be pluggable as well. I can pick the brain. Yeah. So we have one processor, the Modulo controller mm-hmm. that we make and ship. Um, but you can also use, you were mentioning the particle photon, which is another processor you can use. So there's mm-hmm. a different type of base that has, um, it has the four module Modulo sockets on it, but then it also has a socket for a particle photon. So you can use that. And then, of course, other people, you know, the, all, everything's open source. Other people could design other processors that fit into this system. And then they would just slide in like the Modulo controller. And you can also control everything over USB. Um, there's a communication protocol that lets you control all the devices. And right now, there's a Python API for that. Um, someone actually put together a .NET um, library for it, too. Um, I saw someone posted it recently on the forum. Um, and so other, you know, other people could develop other APIs too to control it from other languages. So when you say it's open source, how does that work? Is there, you have open source software. I see your GitHub has mm-hmm. lots of stuff on it, but is the, is the hardware open source as well? Yeah, it is. The, all the hardware designs are also up there on GitHub. So if you wanted to, you could um, download those, get circuit boards made, you know, the, get the part lists from those and make your own modules. Was that something that you had planned from the beginning? And is that was that itself in, in intimidating? I mean, if you, I can see right now, github.com slash modulo labs, mm-hmm. and right there under PCBs, there's all your PCBs there. Doesn't that mean that a bad guy uh, could go and, I don't know, make a bigger version of your company? Well, you know, to be honest, they, um, they, can get one of the boards and look at it mm-hmm. and see how it's made. Mm-hmm. So there's true. not a lot there that's, um, you know, they would be able to get the information. And mm-hmm. as far as giving them the rights to it, I think if they really wanted to do that, they could just work around it anyway. You know, mm-hmm. um, I think people who are relying on that, that sort of intellectual property protection mm-hmm. um, really should think about, whether they have something that's really being protected or whether it's, um, you know, people could just kind of create something very similar and enter the market anyway, in spite of it, you know, being protected by copyright or patents or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It makes me think about uh, 10 years ago, I used to try to obfuscate my .NET code and run code obfuscation tools Mm -hmm. to prevent people from disassembling things. And it's just like, eh, the effort required, it just makes them want to go and tear it apart even more. Yeah. Um, Nate Seidel from SparkFun, I saw a talk he gave a while back about open source. And he was talking about how um, companies can kind of get lazy when they're they're closed source and kind of start to think, oh, we need to really focus on protecting this thing. And while they're doing that, other companies are innovating and going past them. And if you, you know, put those intellectual property concerns aside and focus on innovating, creating new products, creating better products, serving your customers well, then you'll have a successful company, you know, regardless of that. So I thought that was um, great wisdom from him. 
Yeah, and this also, I just like that, that, that there are more c- people who are building companies that can be open source at their core and that there can be some success there, but then there's also giving back to the community and the sense of an open ecosystem. Like I'm, I'm looking and mm-hmm. thinking maybe I could make a, mo- a modulo of my own. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's a little intimidating to make the whole thing, but, you know, I could make a blood sugar meter, uh-huh. you know, prototype of some kind because I'm diabetic and I'm always looking at how to hack diabetes from a hardware perspective. Okay, and yeah, cool. You, you jumpstart me 80% of the way. Yeah. And, you know, you can take one of those PCB designs and just remove the components you don't need, mm-hmm. add in the ones you do, and you don't even have to start from 100% scratch. You don't have to ah. get the board outline and all the connector placement and all of that stuff, right? Right. And you also include a blank slate mm-hmm. modulo, which gives you the the base and uh, an API and GPIO pins. Yeah, that's right. It has a little perf board area. So you can solder up a small circuit and connect it to the rest of your modulo system without having to take on the entire, you know, oh, I need to design this whole thing from scratch. You can focus on just that one piece that's interesting or specific to whatever you're doing. So as we kind of get towards the end here, maybe you could clear something up for me. Is this a computer or is it a microcontroller? And what is the difference between these tiny computers and these t- and tiny controllers? And when does controller end and computer begin? That's a good question. I think a lot of people are confused by that, especially because if you have a Arduino and a Raspberry Pi sitting next mm-hmm. to each other, they look very similar and you're tempted to think that's kind of the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but the difference is that a microcontroller, it's kind of just running one program. So whatever code you write for it, it's mm-hmm. just going to do that by itself, and that's all it's it's going to do. Whereas a computer, something like a Raspberry Pi, um, is running a whole operating system. It's like your desktop computer. So you can run email programs on it and web browsers and all this. You may not necessarily have a display hooked up, but even if you don't, you have background processes that are running all of this other stuff. So it's a much larger system. Um So the modulo controller is a microcontroller and the particle photon that we were talking about earlier is as well. Um, But you can also connect the system to a computer, whether that's your PC, your Mac, a Raspberry Pi, whatever it is, and use it with that too. Uh, Okay. So when I uh, think about things like node bots and we talked to Raquel about node bots a couple of, uh, maybe a hundred episodes ago or so, Uh uh, the idea that where does the brain live, right? Who's doing the thinking? Is it a PC that's then connected via USB and then controlling the the unique componentry and the motors and things? Mm -hmm. Or is it really independent where you can unplug it from the PC and it can, it can be alone and think on its own and run? Like you said, one program. Right. You kind of, with Modulo, you kind of have a choice there. So you can kind of mm-hmm. use it either by itself, just program it to do its own thing. Or if you have something that's, you know, kind of serving as your larger brain, then you can connect it to that and it can um, let your computer do the thinking and then it can just handle whatever commands you send to it from your computer. Very cool. Well, I would really encourage people who are listening and who are taking a look at modulo.co. If you're involved in, in STEM or in education, this would be a really great thing for, for schools and for any kind of a science program or computing program at a school to definitely reach out to Aaron and to the folks at, at Modulo. And thanks so much for chatting with me today. This is fantastic. Thank you, Scott. This was really great. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.